Hello, students. Welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. Today we are in Chapter 9, looking at firms in a competitive market. So, your book refers to it as competitive markets. What most books will refer to it instead is perfect competition. So we'll see what are the defining characteristics of perfect competition in the first section. Then we'll see how firms in these kinds of industries go about maximizing their profit. So there's a whole range of possibilities for how competitive an industry is. On one extreme, you have perfect competition, which we are focusing on in this chapter. The other extreme is a monopoly where there's no competition at all. There's just one firm in the market and that's it. There are also two intermediate cases. Those are oligopolies with a small handful of really big firms. The other intermediate case is monopolistic competition where there's a large number of small firms, but it's not perfectly competitive. We'll dedicate a chapter to each one of those possibilities, but we're going to start out with perfect competition. We'll look at it in both the long run and the short run. There's a reason why this chapter comes after the chapter on costs. We saw earlier that long run costs and short run costs can be different. That's because in the long run, firms have more flexibility. They're not locked into their contracts anymore. They can renegotiate and get new contracts. We'll also talk about sunk costs, another kind of cost that is important to be aware of. So once we figure out how firms maximize profit, that lets derive the firm's supply curve, and that'll be helping us find the market supply curve in both the long run and the short run. So the market supply curve is just a combination of all the individual firms' supply curves. So with that intro out of the way, let's look at what is perfect competition. So there are four conditions. You have to have a lot of buyers and also a lot of sellers. Um, I think your book only says lots of sellers, but you also need lots of buyers as well. That's another part of the condition. Now each firm has to offer similar, if not identical products. We'll see later on that if you have products that are different, then you get monopolistic competition, which gives you somewhat different results. So you have similar products. You also have to have what's called free entry and free exit. By that we mean a new firm could enter this market without paying any additional costs. Also, if some old firm is losing money and they want to get out of the market, they are free to do so. There is no extra fee you got to pay in order to get out. So that's our third condition. The fourth and final condition in order to be perfectly competitive is that everyone is a price taker. We talked about this a little bit in chapter three, if I'm recalling correctly. Here's just a quick refresher for your memory. By a price taker, we mean that each individual firm and each individual customer is just too small on their own to have any influence over price. As a result, everyone, both consumers and producers, has to just accept the prevailing market price. So the market price is $6. You can't go out there and charge six fifty. If you did, nobody would buy from you. Or if you're a buyer and the prevailing market price is $6 and you're trying to negotiate a price of $5, no one's going to accept it. So that's what, what would happen if you have everyone being a price taker. So some of these conditions are related. In order for people to be price takers and firms to be price takers, there have to be both a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers. So one in four are somewhat linked in that way. So that's the definition of perfect competition. Things that are perfect are often kind of hard to find in the real world. So it can be 
difficult to find a really good example of perfect competition. The closest approximation that we can think of is a farmer's market. If you have a really big farmer's market, we have lots and lots of farmers there and lots and lots of customers that can be pretty close to perfect competition. So most markets are not perfectly competitive, but don't worry, we'll have separate chapters on those other cases as well. So you'll get a full understanding of all the possibilities. Now, perfect competition is a bit easier to study than some of the other cases. That's because, like we said over here, everybody is a price taker. You just got to take the prevailing market price as given. That means there's one less variable to worry about. Each firm wants to think about what quantity to produce. They don't think about price because they can't influence price. In other markets where firms have some influence over price, now you got to worry about both price and quantity. So your math is a bit more complicated. We start at the easy case, if it's not especially realistic, and then we'll work our way up to the more complex case where firms have influence over both price and quantity. So the closest approximation to perfect competition is a farmer's market. You will have lots of buyers and sellers, so that condition is being met. Products are similar. Farmer A's corn is probably the same as Farmer B's corn, so they're similar. Free entry and exit, um, maybe not entirely free, but pretty close to it. Perhaps to keep the farmer's market running, maybe you pay a small fee in order to set up your stall. So not entirely free, but pretty close to it. Free exit, though, is probably satisfying. If you want to just stop going to the farmer's market, you are presumably welcome to do so. So it's close to free entry and exit but not exactly there. Everyone a price taker? Um, probably close to being true. Maybe each farmer could have possibly a little bit of influence on our price. Depends upon the market. So it's close to per competition, but not quite exactly there. So that's what perfect competition is. In our next episode, we will learn about how firms maximize profit.